And here we are. Every year, you know, we have uh, an event like this um, on Syria at Chatham House and hope it'll be the last, but, uh, you know, it's not discussing the, the, the crisis. Uh, today, this conference is uh, on the record. We're recording. There will be videos of the proceedings um, uh, posted on our website for those who couldn't make it today because of the snow. Um, please feel free to tweet throughout the day. The hashtag is CHSyria. Um, my name is Lina Khatib, for those of you who don't know me. I head the Middle East and North Africa program here at Chatham House. And I also lead uh, our project on Syria called Syria from Within. And it is really a pleasure for me to welcome uh, some of the really amazing Syrian experts who are involved in this project uh, here uh, to be with us at Chatham House today in what, as far as I know, is the first conference held in London on Syria with a full Syrian cast of speakers. So every single person who will be speaking today is actually from Syria. And I know this may sound a bit strange, for this to be such a rare occasion, but I think it, it kind of underlines, unfortunately, some of the uh, frustrations that we all have regarding how the Syrian conflict has been approached, both publicly as well as in policy communities internationally these days. We called the conference demystifying the Syrian conflict for a reason. It's because there are so many excuses made in the public domain and sometimes by policymakers that we don't know what's really happening in Syria or that uh, rebel-held areas in Syria are completely overrun by rebels and everyone there is radicalized and other misconceptions, other um, excuses basically for not acting. So here we are with a full cast of Syrian speakers who know their stuff, with a project that has been running for a year now and will run you know, for the foreseeable future, Syria from within. And the aim of the project is to present new Syrian voices to the policy community in the UK, in Europe, internationally, and collect, connect the policy community with these Syrians who know what they're talking about. Again, so that there can never be an excuse to say, but we don't know who to talk to, nobody told us, we don't really understand what this issue is. Uh, the project produces every week a piece of analysis or a video or an interview um, about what's happening inside Syria. That's why it's called Syria from Within. The website is syria.chathamhouse.org for those of you who um, would like to check it out. Um, so I want to thank in advance all the Syrians who have come from all over the world, really, to be with us um, at this event today. And I hope the discussion will in some way contribute to enlightening all of us um, about what is actually happening on the ground inside Syria. Um, I'm just going to now hand over to the amazing Lina Sinjab, um, who has been with us um, with the project as one of its key um, experts. And she is also, as many of you know, uh, the BBC's correspondent based in Beirut covering the Middle East. Thank you so much, Lina. The floor is yours. And thank you all. Thank you, Lina, and really thank you all for making it, uh, despite this uh, weather, it's uh, freezing cold outside, and also uh, the Syria situation is also freezing, there's nothing moving uh, but the war. We are here convening at a time where another catastrophe is still taking place in eastern Ghouta in the suburb of Damascus, and yet again, without, uh, despite the pressure from the world, the government and uh, uh, backed by Russia and Iran are not moving even on a basic uh, humanitarian uh, level. This session is going to focus on regime dynamics in regime area and actors uh, behind the regime. And with me here today is a great uh, uh, team of, uh, you know, panel of experts. To my left, I will start with uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Tinan Hatahed. He is a senior fellow at uh, Umran for Strategic Studies and also Al Sharq Forum, uh, where he focuses his uh, studies on uh, governance and local conflicts. Uh, he earned his PhD in IT security, and he will uh, mainly focus today in his uh, contribution and discussion on non-state actors on uh, acting on behalf of the regime. Um, and also after uh, we have also Jihad Yazdaji, who is a journalist uh, based in Beirut, and he is the editor of the Syria Report that started in 2001. The Syria Report, for uh, whom uh, you who don't know, is a report, an online magazine that focuses on economic issues in, the, in, in Syria. Uh, he started this way before uh, the uprising began, but now
now is focused also on uh, uh, the warlords and war economy uh, that is happening in Syria. We're, he we're going to hear from him about this action. Um, and finally, also we have uh, Wael Sawah, who is uh, the editor of the Syrian Observer, who, which is also a website that uh, chooses selected publication on Syria and publish it in English from all the spectrum of uh, pieces written in Arabic. But they also produce their own uh, material that is specialized and focused on Syria. Wael is also uh, a member of the uh, Syrian um, Center for Media uh, Freedom as well. Uh, he's a senior um, analyst a strategic analyst uh, for them. So uh, with this, we would like to begin uh, with uh, Sinan probably. Uh, today, uh, 2017 and now 2018, is for many seen as the regime is winning and Russia is winning the war and acting as the winner. But if you can give us a little bit of an overview, who are the actors on the ground with the, the government that is securing this, uh, this uh, success, if we can call it success and victory? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, to start with, uh, is a very important uh, distinction uh, to make. Uh, in my opinion, it is mostly the military opposition who are losing the war rather than the regime winning the war. Uh, because uh, to, to be able to win the war, there should be a certain capacity to project uh, and, and the capacity to uh, reinstall order, to reinstall stability. And uh, there are enough reasons to, to doubt the ability of the regime to, uh, to be able to, to produce such, such results. Um, the Russians are obviously uh, uh, supporting the regime in, uh, in the air. They, are, uh, they have uh, produced since they arrived into since they intervened in 2015, September 2015, uh, a strong deterrence force that has been uh, used to uh, repel attacks from the opposition, to take also uh, basic, um, very strategic areas. Uh, Aleppo was what the major uh, loss that the opposition has, uh, has gone through. Uh, but when we look at the ground, the diff the, there is a huge, you know, complex situation. Uh, we often speak of the Syrian army, but uh, when we look at the, the composition of the forces, there's a lot of local militias, starting with the, with the NDF, the National Defense Forces, that have been established in 2012, and also the LDF, the local defense forces, which are a different uh, entity and network from the NDF, and that have been uh, increasingly supported by, uh, by the IRGC uh, in terms of finances and also human uh, resources. And without also uh, counting special units like uh, uh, Suhair uh, Al Hassan or Al Nimr, the Tiger Forces, who are very unique composition of forces that combine both the regime uh, forces from uh, the army and the security apparatus. He, he, he is uh, uh, on uh, on the paper part of Mukhabarat al Jawiyya, the air support, the air, uh, air force security. Exactly, but <coughs> he has a capacity to recruit. Uh, uh, members from across the board uh, and enjoy this special status. Uh, so, uh, and that's only counting the Syrian actors. We, don't, we, we haven't even dwelled uh, uh, in uh, the Ira Iranian, Iraqi ba uh, backed uh, militias, uh, Hezbollah, uh, Pakistanis, and also uh, Afghanis. Uh, Zainab Yun uh, are the Pakistanis, and uh, Fatim Yun are the, the Afghanis. Uh, so, uh, very complex. We often speak of the factional uh, nature of the opposition, but we very, uh, in very few cases, we describe also the functional scene that exists from uh, within the loyalist force. And uh, there is a huge doubt on the capacity of Damascus, of the government, to be able to command and control all of these factions if the threat or the perception of external threat doesn't exist anymore. And uh, it's easy to, 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 to be able to launch an attack when they are fearing Nusra, when they are fearing uh, the Syrian, Free Syrian Army, when they are attacking ISIS. But once this, uh, th this threat or fear disappear, there will be new dynamics kicking in. Uh, there will be uh, uh, competition over resources, there will be conflict of interest, and a myriad of small conflicts that will uh, emerge uh, across the country. 
Uh, talking about uh, the resources as well, maybe we can come to you, uh, Jihad, uh, and we will be back to you, Sinan, but uh, talking about these resources, these non-state actors or even warlords, whether foreign or local, uh, local uh, uh, non-state actors in, inside government-controlled areas. If you can give us a little bit of an overview view of the situation in the economic during, uh, during the war, and maybe shed the light a little bit about this dynamic, about these militias, how they are sourcing and financing themselves. Yes, thank you, Lina, and good morning to everyone, and thank you, for, uh, thank you to Chatham House for having me here. Um, I think I would like to start just to uh, <coughs> highlight a few things. <clears throat> about the state of the Syrian economy in, uh, today. Uh, one thing I think which is important to know, I mean, obviously you do realize that the economy is massively destroyed, that there is a huge, uh, uh, there has been a huge outf outflow of capital, but also of human resources. I mean, the outflow of the Syrian middle class, I think will leave its impact in the long term very significantly on the Syrian economy. Uh, but I think it's also uh, important to know that 2017 was probably the first year since the beginning of the uprising that the Syrian economy grew. We don't have accurate data yet, but the num you have a number of indicators that, that seem to show that there has been a small growth. <coughs> Sorry for that. And why there has been this growth? <coughs> Sorry again. Uh, oh, first of all, because uh, battles have uh, stopped in most of the western parts, most inhabited parts of the country. Uh, so, uh, so you have a lot of factories that have started pro producing again. You have less checkpoints on the road, so transport costs are lower. Uh, but also because the regime took back uh, the main uh, gas fields in the central area near Palmyra, <coughs> meaning there is more gas production, more electricity production, lower production costs, and so on. And this has been reflected, for instance, in the price of the Syrian currency or even in the uh, 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 value of the stock exchange index. I mean, the stock exchange index in Damascus <coughs> had the highest growth in the world last year. <coughs> just, well, it doesn't mean much, to be honest, uh, but I th it's just good to know as a... So, um, obviously, we are, of course, talking, one should not have too many illusions. We are starting from a very, very low point, and the impact of this growth is not really very meaningful in terms of, you know, increase in incomes, in job creation, uh, and so on. Investment is also very low, whether it's private or public. The, the, the state is broke. Uh, um, we, we uh, finally, maybe I also want to highlight the issue of reconstruction, in terms of w where are we in terms of the Syrian reconstruction. There is no such thing as reconstruction today, and there are no such expectation today from the Syrian government that there will be reconstruction anytime soon. What I mean by reconstruction, I mean here uh, the large scale inflow of funds that will help rebuild the country's infrastructure. This is not happening, and this is not happening because there is no money. The regime is broke for obvious reasons. The Iranians and the Russians that who won the war don't have the money, and the countries that have the money, EU, Gulf, World Bank, uh, well, have lost the war, and they're not going to fund a country, you know, uh, controlled by Iran. So we are in a situation of an economy that has stopped decreasing last year, uh, that, has, that is in an extremely bad shape, but I, I would argue that the government has probably in front of it one, two, three years where it has less pressures because it has at least enabled to stabilize the situation. <clears throat> in terms of Russia or Iran, uh, maybe also that's something we need to highlight today. One needs to know that there are so far very, very limited Iranian and Russian investment in Syria. The only area where you have some investment is the energy sector. You also have some form of competition between Russia and Iran. Uh, one should not overstate the impact of this competition on the political situation, but I think it's also important to understand this, uh, that little investment, you have a lot of um, bilateral visit from Russian and Iranian businessmen, they often return empty-headed, not interested, uh, because for, you know, uh, Syria in the first place was not a very attractive place to invest in, and that today the current conditions are also not fit for, for investment. But there is some, some sort of also competition between the Russians and Iranians <coughs> on the ground, not only, also, not only on a military level, but also on economic level. We'll come back to you, uh, uh, Jihad, on this. But we want, I want to bring you in, um, Wael. Wael, you've been also working uh, in the day after, uh, trying to find common grounds uh, on uh, the uh, po political opposition that is available inside Syria, and also trying to document
document some of the work uh, that is uh, done to uh, preserve what is lost from you know uh, government institutions how do you see in the current situation where actually even if it is opposition losing not regime winning but they are the ones who are having the, the upper hand do you think there is any room of uh, maneuver uh, at a time where there is a failure internationally to pressure the government to even stop the attacks on on eastern water thank you very much um, so as everybody knows the uh, the deteriorating situation in Syria has not only uh, disrupted the, the economy and the building and the bridges and the factories, but also the, the social fabric. And this, in my opinion, could be the biggest loss the Syrian nation and the Syrian society has been suffering from. While uh, you can rebuild the infrastructure and uh, rebuild uh, uh, the economy, the uh, social fabric when it's ruptured, it's very, very difficult to, to mend again. This is, a, this is the, 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 the key point if you want to discuss any uh, common ground among the Syrians for the future. There is, in the, mean, in, 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 in the foreseen time, there is no way that the regime stops its assault on the Syrian uh, people. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Hatah had mentioned uh, a minute ago that the Syrian regime has not won, but the opposition has lost. I, I totally agree with that. However, the Syrian regime is in a situation of self-defense that if he either continues uh, bombing and, and, and killing the people and destroying uh, its enemies, which is the Syrian people, or he will completely lose and be out of uh, the scene. So the point now which, uh, which we need to face is, number one, how to put pressure on the regime to stop that, and number two, how we can mend the uh, social fa fabric which has been ruptured. And it's, in both cases, it's very, very difficult uh, tasks. There is, in, uh, among the Syrian opposition, there is, uh, as you know, there is the, the, the outside opposition and the inside opposition. And in the inside opposition, we mean those opposition factions that still exist in Syria, and they consider themselves opposition. And part of them are part of the High Negotiation Commission that works with the uh, outside opposition in order to reach a solution, political solution in Syria. Now, these people have some network and some uh, social uh, communities that support them inside Syria. We need to uh, use uh, this network of, of opposition, which is inside Syria, and we need to use the Syrian civil society that uh, is working from out Syria in, in towards Syria, but at the same time, the, uh, the, uh, the groups and initiatives that are still in Syria and they work in a rather an apolitical uh, background. Some of them want to, to, def to defend themselves, to protect themselves from the government atrocities, but they are providing some very uh, excellent uh, work on that. Uh, it will be a very, very difficult task. It will not be easy at all to even start uh, bridging the gap between the, the, the Syrians, but it's a step that has no alternative. We cannot lose this chance. We cannot sacrifice the, the situation where the Syrians remain as they are now, uh, divided, ruptured, and uh, uh, their relationship is, hate, is built more on hate, hatred and distrust rather than on what joins them as a nation in order to build a new Syria. Easier said than done, uh, uh, well, especially we've seen in the latest assault on Ghouta, the hatred message coming from, of course, some of the community inside uh, Damascus in government-controlled area. Where do you think we, where there is difficulty and, uh, to maneuver among the 
political or non-political opposition that are in government controlled area to push the narrative or change the narrative and, uh, in an area that is controlled by the regime and there is still the fear of also uh, you know uh, crack down from the regime of any activity even on a civil level their job is very very difficult uh, I, I I don't want to be in their shoes but uh, their role is, and at the same time, it's very essential in order to, uh, in, in order that they talk with the uh, other people inside Syria that are still loyal to the regime. Uh, there is the the people in the uh, in the middle, the people in the gray area. We need to we need to talk to these people. The the big mistake which we had made through over the the revolution is that. We not only ignored these people, but we um, we hostilized them. We, uh, we 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 turned them into enemies. And uh, some of these people can <coughs> be worked with and can be uh, relied on in uh, mending the the uh, the Syrian fabric uh, again. But the, the 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 mission is very difficult again. It's next to impossible. But we cannot, we cannot just lose hope in, in, in this case. And while the regime is using all its forces in order to destroy, as I said, to kill people and destroy the, 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 the uh, resources and the infrastructure, but at the same time, it's continuing to destroy the social fabric and to, to, to implant more and more hatred and distrust among the, the, the Syrian communities. This is something we should and we cannot afford to go to. We cannot allow uh, the regime or anybody else in order to, to, to uh, deepen the division, the already division uh, among the Syrians. I'll come back to you, uh, Sinan, please, if you can uh, elaborate more on the role of these uh, uh, militias. You know, there are, they are foreign uh, militias. They don't belong to Syria. There is tension even happening, even in loyalist areas, towards some of these uh, uh, militias or non-state actors. And as you rightly mentioned, once the war uh, that they are launching against what they call terrorist groups, uh, then what's going to happen? Who's going to control them? If you can elaborate more about their positioning, uh, their tactics and um, where they are located more. There is, there is the impression among many that you know the, the Iranians are trying to change into the demography inside Syria. But give us a little bit more on that, please. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I will start by by the demographic uh, engineering or re-engineering uh, that is ongoing in Syria. Uh, one must not also, you know, over exaggerate the, the situation. There have been, however, uh, specific efforts to uh, uh, evacuate certain key strategic areas. So around Damascus, uh, for example, in Daraya, uh, in the southern belt, uh, with the ongoing uh, uh, negotiations to evacuate Al Yarmouk and uh, Mukhayyam Palestine, the, the Palestinian camps. Uh, and also the same goes for Berze, for Kabun, and now for Jobar and Eastern Ghouta. There's this certain... Uh, These are the suburbs are surrounding Damascus, basically, uh, suburbs uh, surrounding the capital. Exactly. So there have been uh, concentrated efforts by Iranian-backed uh, forces uh, to evacuate the area, to create a, a kind of belt around the city so they control it better. This have been preceded by similar uh, activities in Zabadani and uh, in Madaya to the west of the capital. And when we go and try to have a more abstract view, an overview of Syria, we can see a certain uh, pattern of moving around uh, along the Aleppo-Damascus uh, highway, which is the most important highway in the country because it connects the north to the south, but also Syria to Turkey and Syria to Jordan and the GCC behind. So we see a high concentration of uh, Iranian-backed forces in Qalamun, uh, around Homs, in Qusayr. Now they are attempting at evacuating northern Homs in Rastan and, and al Hule, also to, to, to continue in southern of Aleppo, in Hadr, and Abu Dhur with the latest uh, campaign uh, on uh, southern Aleppo and eastern Idl uh, Idlib. And uh, this is 
have been uh, coordinated by a very condensed and focused uh, presence in Eastern Aleppo, uh, uh, the areas that have been uh, taken or seized by uh, uh, after the, the evacuation of the opposition. Uh, and, and we'll take the example of Aleppo because it's very uh, um, telling. Uh, so LDF, the local defense forces, have been established in 2014 uh, after the failure of the NDF in the eyes of the Iranians. Uh, the Iranians. Uh, the NDF is the National Defense Force, which is like a paramilitary that exactly. was established and trained by the Iranians. Exactly. So they have been perceived uh, as a failure because they have they haven't been able to control them enough. They are very localized. They haven't been. Uh, they have refused several orders to uh, orders to move from one front to another, and they have multiply the patronage. So either local or in Lebanon, for example, for certain Druze, for certain Maronites uh, forces, or basically because they haven't been uh, you know, efficient on the ground. And so they created the LDF with a stronger vetting process of choosing the, the people that are, will be most loyal to the IRGC. We could see, I'm not saying that all of them are Shia, by the way, a lot of them are Sunnis. We're counting around 60% of the bulk force of the LDF are Sunnis. But the top leadership are either Shias or uh, very close to the ideology of the Islamic uh, um, uh, Republic. So they have started in Aleppo. We, uh, one of their most famous forces are Baqir and uh, Ahrar Sfira, a small city next to, to Aleppo, and um, Ahrar, uh, sorry, uh, al Membej, for example. They, they, we count around seven uh, different factions that exist only in Aleppo. Uh, this are, these factions are in control of transportation. They are in control of uh, security. Uh, they have even clashed with the Russian police force when they were deployed <laughs> in the city. And later on, they have withdrawn the Russians, not the LDF. Uh, they are also creating uh, local uh, NGOs that are rehabilitating certain schools, certain uh, hospitals, and all under the name of uh, Jihad Bina, for example, which is a Hezbollah uh, in, uh, INGO created in 2006 uh, for the construction of the southern uh, uh, suburbs of uh, of uh, Beirut, they are all under simply the name of uh, an Iranian, uh, for example, uh, NGO. So these are ongoing uh, uh, activities. They do, and I agree with Jihad. They do not. We cannot prescribe them as reconstructions. They are small bribes, small, you know, services uh, produced and. Uh, uh, and made available to the local co uh, communities who are deprived from the state service uh, uh, in a way uh, to, to alleviate and to uh, give uh, uh, leverage to, to the LDF. Uh, the situation is very complex at the end and uh, I can. Uh, I don't want to to uh, to take over the discussion. But. It's just like uh, wondering what's the reaction from the local community towards these groups that they know uh, they are basically controlled or run by not the state actually. Well, in a lot of cases, they, they don't have the choice. So, for example, not in, in in eastern Aleppo, they don't have the choice. The the LDF is not only there, but is only in charge. But it's also in charge security. So. The only choice is to go along or to face evacuation to Idlib, where they could uh, be bombed or uh, or killed or uh, or worse, worse, you know, uh, uh, live the, the evacuation episode again. So, in, uh, in, in we we cannot ask much for civilians in this case. In other cases, for example, where they were given the choice, like in Deir ez -Zor, they were given the choice between SDF. And Which is the Syrian Democratic Forces, mainly made of the Kurdish uh, exactly, forces. Exactly, of, of uh, the PYD and uh, uh, the EPG. Uh, where they were given the choice between SDF and uh, the regime forces, even though they mis deeply mistrust uh, the SDF, they have still shown the SDF because it seems like a lesser of an evil. So uh, in, in all cases where there is uh, a kind of equilibrium, but the offer proposed by both choices. So if both are offering stabilization, the regime always comes in second or last. 
Uh, Jihad, let, let's move to you and talk about these, especially these militias and their connection to the war economy. Uh, not only whether uh, the foreign uh, um, militias uh, as the Shia ones, but also the, the non-state actors of the Syrian, uh, Syrian ones, the warlords, uh, the siege policy of, uh, of the economy. How, does, how is this operating, uh, if you can explain to us a little bit more? Yes, I mean, quite clearly you have uh, had since, uh, for now, a number of years, the emergence of new economic patterns in Syria, new business networks, uh, new business figures, uh, today, if you look at all the main prominent Syrian businessmen, you obviously have, you know, the Rami Makhlouf, Mohammed Hamsho, these names are relatively well known, but you have a lot of new figures that were not known before the uprising. Samer Foz, Hossam Qatirji, uh, Mazen Tarazi. Um, and what is actually very interesting is that uh, while most of the previous business elite associated with the regime is currently under Western sanctions, None of the new individuals is under any sanction. Um, and, and it's quite telling. It's not clear what this means, but still, that's something to, you know, to, uh, to highlight. In, um, a, a three years ago, there were elections at the Chamber of Commerce of Aleppo. And out of the 12 elected members, 10 were actually entirely new figures. You had only two, two from the previous board of directors of the Aleppo Chamber. And in Damascus, out of 12, you had seven new individuals. Why? Well, because the previous ones either left the country, do not have any economic assets as they used, did not support the regime in a way or another. And these new individuals that have emerged, they actually serve a lot of roles. They, and they are not necessarily Alawites. You have Alawites, but you have a lot of Sunnis. Qatarji, uh, Foz uh, are Sunnis, for instance. They but this is a tactic that the regime also played even in the past, where you know, the, the not concentrate all the wealth of the, of, or the benefits in the Alawite community, but also among other communities, so it doesn't give itself the uh, nature of sectarian regime, right? Of course, of course, but it's also a response to specific needs. Someone like Hossam Qatarji, for instance, is someone who originally is from Raqqa, has ties with Raqqa, so he has been able to play a role of intermediary to ship wheat and oil from the eastern area to the regime. This is something that many former businessmen who were close to the regime could not deliver. He can deliver this. Uh, Samer Foz too has that type of connections. So, so they, they fit a specific role, these individuals. Uh, and of course, I mean, besides these well-known figures, you have a, the emergence of a whole new number of NGOs. Most of today, the services that are provided by the, uh, re on the regime side in areas outside Damascus, in Hama, in Ladiye, in Sueda, is very often through new NGOs that are established by the wife of a militia leader or the brother of a militia leader. They are themselves registered with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Some of them get contracts from the UN. So you have a whole network of new, you know, uh, uh, again, business institutions that are emerging that, that made money, again, as uh, intermediaries with ISIS or the Kurds uh, through smuggling, through looting, through kidnapping. These are business sectors in a certain way. But Jihad, how is this going to be controlled at some point, you know, that now the regime is winning or, or, or just uh, uh, making count on the uh, opposition losing? How they're going to regain all of this within a state institution as it was controlled before? Well, I don't think that uh, there is an answer to that. I don't think the regime knows uh, really how to, to control back. They may, in some areas, it's easier to control. So if you go to Damascus, you don't feel really that, you know, this sense of chaos that you can find some area, other areas. But if you go to Sueda, for instance, if you go to Hama, there is a sense of chaos because of the various militias and the uh, various centers of power. Um, in Lebanon, the war ended only because, one, there was a political deal backed by the international and regional actors and because you had the Syrian army there. You know, telling everyone, you give us our, your, your weapons, and then you get a share of, the, of uh, political power. In Syria, there is no such power, or rather there are so many uh, power, you actually need even an intermediary between the various regional and international actors. So uh, to be honest, I, I don't know, and I'm, it's not clear how this is going to work. So far, the, 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 these NGOs, these individuals, these businessmen fill a gap. When the regime will, uh, will, will, will want to recontrol, I think it will face major obstacles, and I don't think yet it has yet a, uh, an answer to that. You've mentioned uh, earlier about the... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, just, just to quickly jump on what Jihad was uh, saying, I totally agree with Jihad on, on this, but I, I need to add one more point. Such, such a situation cannot be solved and, unless one of the two parties wins completely the war. As we said earlier, the regime has not won. 
is still weak. It's still uh, in need of these uh, uh, paramilitia and uh, militias, paramilitary uh, Novorish uh, businessmen, etc., in order to complement the regime's role in, in the regime control uh, areas. Until or unless the regime makes a, an, a final uh, victory, or uh, vice versa, or unless a settlement has been reached where uh, the, the, the atrocities end and the war ends and then a kind of uh, peaceful uh, era starts in a way or another. It's the only way where we can control these, uh, uh, these groups. And we cannot do that, unfortunately, based on Syrian uh, capacity, Syrian uh, elements. There has to be some international efforts in order to contain these groups and uh, these uh, non-state actors. Um, the, 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 the other very important point I want to mention is that uh, the regime is trying here and there in order to, at least in the, in the, in the media, uh, to, to cut off the influence of uh, these groups. We saw that in Hama, we saw that in Eastern Aleppo, uh, there were reports in Sana and other uh, official uh, newspapers about uh, uh, cutting the, the, the support, the, the salaries of uh, these groups, etc. But on the ground, they are still uh, occupying their positions, and simply because the regime cannot fill in their place. Many of these groups now are. Uh, distributing gas and distributing f uh, bread and, and, and providing uh, basic services which the government is supposed to do. The government cannot do that. The government is unable to do that. And that's why the, the regime needs these people to continue until, as I said, somebody makes a clear uh, victory on him. Uh, while I was going to ask uh, uh, Jihad about the reconstruction maybe as a tool for maneuver with the regime to do some sort of settlement, uh, but maybe you can start with, uh, with this uh, talking about this tool uh, internationally, if it can bring some sort of a deal, and then maybe uh, uh, um, Jihad can elaborate more on the economic side of it. Well, as Jihad said, so far, officially, the, the, uh, the powers, the... Uh, the uh, countries that has that have the money to invest in in the reconstruction of Syria have announced over and over again that they will not spend a penny in the regime's control areas before a political settlement. We we have been let down. We have been, if you want, deceived by Western governments over and over again. And we do not have any reason to believe them in this. But so far, this is what they are repeating over and over again. And I think this should be our position. We cannot start a real, meaningful reconstruction in Syria and the regime control area before a political settlement. That will be a crime uh, for the Syrian people. However, having mentioned this, I think uh, the, the areas which are now outside the regime controls, the uh, de-escalation areas, for example, uh, could, be, could start with, uh, with the basic services and reconstruction in order to encourage refugees to return to these areas and in order to give an example of how Syria can be reconstructed and can be rebuilt as uh, uh, as a place where all people live together and work together and understand each other. Uh, if we fail to do so, if we continue to leave Syria divided into the useful Syria, which is uh, flashy and flourishing and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, secular, etc., and the, uh, the non-useful Syria, which is deteriorating and uh, people are still living in very, very bad circumstances, we will not give an example of what future Syria we want. So this is very important. Reconstruction needs to be used as a tool in order to make a serious pressure on, on Russia and number in, in primarily Iran, maybe, in order to, to, uh, uh, to 
to reach a political settlement. Jihad, you've mentioned before that you know uh, the the parties involved and in supporting the regime, whether Russia and Iran, they don't have the money to do the reconstruction. But there are lots of talks, especially in Damascus, uh, about deals being made, about China being uh, get uh, invited and being on board. Uh, even there are names given who is going to rebuild this area and that area, and people, um, you know, for example, Berzi or Kabun. Uh, people uh, who originally lived there, uh, their houses destroyed, they, they were told that you, you don't have a space to, to come back to. So can you just elaborate more from the economic side, who has the shares, and if there are areas where they can actually start uh, working, not the ones that were massively destroyed, but other areas? Yeah, <clears throat> well, I think, uh, of course, there are going to be some investments. And of course, some Russian, Iranian, Chinese companies and others are looking for opportunities in Syria. Egyptian. Yes, possibly a bit Egyptian, absolutely. They are looking for opportunities because they have less competition. There are no Western companies, there is no Gulf companies. They are looking for opportunities because the country is so much destroyed so there is a lack of supply, there's, so there is a need for investment to some extent. So you have companies going and, you know, um, but, but again, the, the, the issue is what, what scale are we talking about? And, and the scale here in, in with, with, compared with the needs of the, of the, of the country is, uh, is very small. I mean, the, the amounts we are seeing is very small. But what we are seeing is, I mean, I, I think if we could, if you were to talk of what the regime strategy is, the regime probably today doesn't have a, re a clear reconstruction strategy. What it has is some priorities. One of these is to pay back in a way or another the Russians and the Iranians, because that's what they are asking for. So it is awarding assets, resources in the long term, and that is going to have a negative impact, of course, on the fiscal revenues of the government, its capacity to invest, because it's, going a share of, it's giving a share of its phosphate resources to the Russians, it's giving a share of its oil or gas resources to the, to the Russians, for instance. So that's going to have an impact. So one priority, if you want, is satisfying these, uh, uh, these countries. Another priority is uh, enabling regime cronies to capitalize on this destruction. So we have a very uh, obvious example, which is the Basatin Arazi area in Damascus. Basically, this is an area of informal housing near, I mean, in Damascus. It's, so it's informal housing, but it is very close to upscale areas, the Mazde Motorway, Kafir Susi. So the value of the land there is very high. So what the regime has done, basically, it has issued a decree in 2012, Decree 66 2012, very famous, which enables the expulsion of this population. But it has also enacted another decree that is less understood, which is, I think, also very important, Decree 19 of 2015, which enables local councils, cities, governorates, to establish private sector holding companies to develop these areas. And these private sector holding companies are a means for the regime to transfer the ownership of these lands, high value land located to close to the centers of the cities, to private investors. So typically, the Basatina Razi uh, project the regime has issued Decree 66, has expelled people, has issued this new law, and has signed contract with private investors to develop this area into an upscale area. Who do we find among the private uh, investors? Samer Foz, Mazen Tarazi, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. These the big new individuals, warlords. the new warlords, who again, interestingly, are outside sanctions. And I think somewhere there's a, there's a signal they're sending, maybe to the Europeans, maybe to the Gulf, that come on guys, I mean, you know, these ones are without sanctions, you can do business with them. It's a way of attracting them. But beyond this, these two priorities, that is, uh, you know, uh, paying back your allies and uh, uh, giving, you know, uh, enabling your cronies to capitalize on this, I don't see any other really reconstruction strategy in Syria. And, and through this, do you think that there is any room within the government's thinking or strategies of allowing refugees to come back, at least for the areas that are not <coughs> You know, totally destroyed uh, refugees in Lebanon and in, in Turkey? It, well, it depends. In, in uh, Overwhelmingly, no. Refugees, poor Sunnis don't come back. Let's say it as it is. Poor Sunnis don't come back. There is a sectarian dimension. To some extent, there is a social class dimension that we don't talk about it, uh, don't talk about enough, which I think is very important. So these people, as much as possible, will not return. The problem in a situation like Lebanon, for instance, where Hezbollah, which is a Shia group, doesn't want either poor Sunnis. So Hezbollah doesn't want poor Sunnis, and Bashar Assad doesn't want poor Sunnis. So what do you do with these people? You don't have a clear answer to that. In some areas, such as Aleppo, for instance, uh, it's less problematic. 
because anyway, Aleppo is, is, is all Sunnis almost, so it doesn't really uh, make much, uh, uh, much of a change. And I don't think, if you want, that the regime is seeing that really strictly from a sectarian point of view. It is seeing these communities because these communities are opposing it. <coughs> these communities were the ones that were demanding change. Uh, the the Mazi, uh, the Basatin Arazi district of Mazi that I mentioned earlier, which has been destroyed and whose population have been expelled, the official explanation for that by the regime is that these are informal areas, the living conditions are poor, so these poor people, you have to take care of them, give them better living conditions. But of course, they selected an area inhabited by communities that opposed it. Not Mazda 86, not Ash al Warwar, not, uh, you know. Uh, and these are areas. also other suburbs of Damascus, but mainly inhabited by Alawite community uh, loyal to, uh, to President Bashar al Assad. That brings me to the question to you, Sinan, about also the, the local militias and how this, how the, the sectarian dimension is playing. How uh, is the Iranian, are the Iranians trying to change the ideology, to enforce a different ideology on Syria, and how the Syrians, uh, um, you know, loyal to Assad, reacting to that? Well, I think the, the biggest problem that Iran is facing in Syria is demography. Um, um, many people make uh, the amalgam of confusing Iran and Alawites as being you know, uh, closely related or, uh, or allies. But when we look in, uh, in reality on what's going on, we see that the Iranians have been much more uh, effective in uh, recruiting from uh, Sun poor Sunni Arabs, rather, uh, especially in the tribal region, in a, around Aleppo, in certain area in Dar'a, rather, for example, than in the coastal region. Whereas on the coastal region, uh, like in Atikia and Tartus, they have been, their offices have been closed several times. There have been also some reported clashes. The, the Alawite Sunni, uh, sorry, the Alawite community in general, uh, uh, do not see uh, eye to eye uh, with the Iranian, what the, Syri the future of Syria should be. Uh, they are much more secular, they are much more uh, uh, see themselves closer to the, to the Russians rather than the Iranians. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that by recruiting that uh, there is also a Shiification process ongoing. There, there are, we're not, we're not, no, we, we must not be mistaken, but not whoever was recruited was Shiified. We're speaking about a political loyalist, uh, uh, loyalists, you know, build up rather than um, a religious, a religious one. one. Uh, so, for example, let's take the example of Force 313. And 313 refers to the numbers of uh, the companion of uh, Imam Jafar in one of the battles. And also, uh, so Imam Jafar is a, is, a, is a very famous known of the Jafaris, uh, you know, the lineage of. Uh, 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 of leadership, and also is the number of the companions of Imam al-Mahdi in the future, uh, the, the, the Shia, you know, Messiah in a, in a certain way. So uh, this number, sacred number, uh, refers to, you know, a very, you know, Shia, Jafari identity. But when we look at uh, the composition of their fighters, uh, lots of them have been recruited in Dara. Uh, even though the leaderships are from Zahra and Nubul, but, but their base is from Dara. Which is mainly a Sunni community then. Yeah, Sunni and also the community that started the uprising and have you know, very strong social uh, fabric that haven't been uh, you know, uh, uh, ruptured like in other areas. Uh, so uh, uh, another example is Baqir. Baqir is interesting because they are from Baqara. And Baqara is a very large uh, 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 tribe, tribe. In, in Syria. They, they, they extend from southern Aleppo to their resort. And we see different uh, uh, level of, uh, or different, uh, let's say, patronage. Some of them have been allied to, to Shias uh, 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 and have been Shiified and created the Baqar, Baqar sorry, force. Others have joined ISIS, others have joined uh, Nusra, others have stayed with the regime, some have uh, fight, uh, fought and still fighting with SDF. So this is an ongoing battle. Uh, this is what I'm referring to, this, the counter example. But, uh, but uh, I just like to, to quickly uh, revisit the question of reconstruction because uh, the way I see it, reconstructions do not come along. It comes with stabilization and comes with institutionalization. And I think 
uh, there is a number of dilemmas that the regime faces in terms of policy making. Uh, so uh, if it wants to attract international funds, it needs to project a certain level of uh, accountability and uh, this means that it needs to depredate of some of the business cronies, and this will mean that it will arrange the regime and put them against the, uh, against uh, the state. So there is always this set of dilemmas that exist when we speak of restructuring, and the very limited capacity uh, uh, of Damascus to come up with the solutions. But uh, and but the, the other part of it is also the, how the Iranians and the Russians. Are, uh, are evaluating all of this. So, uh, for example, the Iranians are extremely anti-essentializing uh, the state uh, and to, to preserve the, st the institutions of, of the Syrian state. The, the LDF have been pressured uh, to, to be allowed as part of the Syrian army, and let, um, differently in, uh, in opposing to the NDF who are uh, not recognized as, uh, as a governmental force, LDF are. Uh, and they and why preserving the relationship and, and uh, collaboration with the Iranians? The Iranians uh, have tried to infiltrate uh, the the security apparatus. They have uh, placed uh, high officers in Khabarat um, al also in the Air Force, Air Force security. security, also in Amnesty Yassi, the political uh, apparatus. And now there is an ongoing uh, uh, competition between the Russians. And the Iranians on whom to to uh, to appoint in, in key positions in the security apparatus. Uh, so this this is only speaking about uh, socialization. But when we speak about re reconstruction, there is the public and the private sector. Uh, the public sector, the oil and gas, have more or less being promised to the Russians, and the Iranians are feeling enraged with this. Uh, when we look at the media, uh, the Iranian media, they are calling for you know, conspiracy that they have been pushed by, uh, out by the, by the senior regime and the Russians, uh, that, they are, that they, they are the only one who have invested not only men, but money. And there's the $6 billion uh, credit line and much more. So uh, uh, to, to see how the regime will be able to, 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 to keep playing both actors is very interesting because there is this aspect. We, also, we always speak about the Iranians and the Russians. Uh, playing the regime, but there is the other uh, aspect of it, which is the regime uh, enjoying the margin that ex that is created by this competition of two actors, and and I think it's uh, the m the more the the regime advances, the more it seems and looks like the war is over. The hardest it will become to the regime to manage this. It's a very interesting point to end up, and uh, we'll open the, the, uh, the floor now for more questions from the audience uh, on this, but please like, introduce yourself and see who you're going to uh, ask the question for. Uh, we'll start with you, please. Uh, thank you. Um, David Butter, Associate Fellow at Chatham House. Um, I've got a question sort of bouncing off that last point, but more generally about foreign exchange. Um, uh, to, to Jihad first. Um, how would you explain the strength of the Syrian pound over the last 12 months, um, 5.15 at the uh, end of 2016 to 4.34 on the official rate at the moment, and a pretty small differential to the black market. So that suggests there are some inflows of foreign exchange coming. You mentioned nobody really wanting the poor uh, refugees, but this does suggest that some of that middle class capital flight uh, may be coming back. I'm just wondering whether there's any evidence for that. And related to that, in terms of the foreign exchange needs of the regime, um, it seems to me that the, the primary ones are to be able to import wheat and to import crude oil. Um, and I'm just wondering what the status is now in your understanding of the crude oil supply agreements with Iran. Because if Iran uh, is genuinely uh, pissed off about being cut out of certain areas, of maybe revenue generating parts of the economy, uh, are they still willing to continue to supply this very vital crude oil supply that really keeps the, uh, the regime afloat in some ways? Should we answer one by one the question? Yeah. <coughs> we'll start by one by one, and then maybe we'll take more. And please remember that, uh, you know, to, if you're tweeting, to use the hashtag uh, CHSyria while during the session, please. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I think you are raising an important issue, David, in the sense that, uh, you know, for when you work on the Syrian economy today, you work with very, very limited data. 
so uh, the, the capacity really to, um, if you want to, uh, to utilize what is existing in terms of information is pretty difficult. There is no clear explanation uh, in the sense uh, to, to the, uh, um, uh, uh, to the improvement in the price of the currency. There are a number of factors that you could think uh, you know, are behind this. One of these, for instance, is the, re the success of the regime, which have had a psychological impact. There is a sense uh, among a lot of people that the war is ending. I'm not seeing any inflows, but most probably you are seeing a big reduction in outflows. There are less people who are taking their money out. So this could be uh, uh, playing a role. Uh, a second role is that uh, uh, today you also, I mean, the Syrians that have left the country in the last uh, uh, few years, many of them have started working and, and are sending money back. I mean, already we have seen data from Germany, for instance, uh, that was last year. I haven't seen anything uh, recent which showed an increase in the remittances, although it was still modest in terms of overall volume. But if you take into account, you know, that one more year has passed, so the, the inflow of, uh, you know, foreign currency most likely has also increased slightly. But to me, very honestly, this is not a sufficient explanation. Um, and I am still struggling to understand why. I mean, one has to say, I mean, 434 is the official, the unofficial, the black mark one is 465. Right, so it is. So from 500 to 465, it's an improvement of around 10%, uh, slightly less, which is not insignificant. What, what you can say, already in 2016, the currency had mostly stabilized, actually. It hadn't declined enormously, and that's the second year in a row. Um, but it remains a challenging question, because to this day, if you, you were to look, if we were to have the balance of payment figures, I mean, obviously, you have a very strong commercial de trade deficit. Uh, there's, you know, this difficult to, to uh, you know, you don't have inflows, of, of course, of tourism. I mean, you know, the traditional sources of foreign currency are not there. We also don't have numbers from Iran or Russia. It, it isn't very clear. Uh, so there is no obvious one. There must be a mix of factors, a psychological one, some remittances, possibly Iran. Now, moving to the second question, oil, Iran, and the credit line. Now, uh, the, 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 in terms of the, the, the oil imports, I mean, there, there's no cash being dispersed to the Syrian government. It's a credit line. It's basically the Syrians that are importing crude oil. I would imagine, because you raised the issue of what Sinan was saying, you know, the tensions that uh, be exist between uh, Iran and the regime, as Sinan was saying, you see this in the media. Um, one thing is that the, the demand for the uh, regime are, sl are slightly lower because of the gas production. Uh, and some oil production, although limited. Um, and, you know, the winter is almost over. In one more month, the winter is almost over. So demand for gas oil will be weaker, at least in the month ahead. But we have seen already, uh, it, at the beginning of 2017, if not wrong, a suspension of Iranian supplies of, of oil products, and this disrupted a bit the transport network in Syria. So I think it's important to raise this issue in the sense that, yes, that's a card in the hands of the Iranian, the oil supplies. So far this year, they don't seem to have been using it. But it could be, you know, a card that they could, they could use in the foreseeable future. Sinan, you want to add something? Yeah, yeah, quickly on the same point of oil. So I, I, I don't think that the Iranians are interested in exploiting the oils in Syria uh, as a financial uh, leverage. It's mostly to, to be able to control even further uh, the, re the regime and the local, you know, uh, militias. Uh, I see, uh, this is how I perceive it, and I think is perceived by the Iranians. Uh, the oil, ca as it is right now, um, uh, is of bad quality. Is the heavy crude is not the light crude. The light crude is in Romelian, is very, uh, and under the control of uh, the PYD and SDF. Haqlul uh, Omari, for example, uh, in east in uh, eastern Deir ez Zor is completely destroyed, uh, not in a condition to be. Uh, uh, to, to, be, uh, to be used. So it's mostly a way to control rather than a way to extract money, in my opinion. Uh, as for the remittances, uh, I think uh, there is also, we shouldn't be, uh, and I think you agree with me, they are, they are not going to generate reconstruction. They are not going to generate uh, economy uh, activities. It's just a way to alleviate uh, sufferings. Uh, we'll take an, uh, another question, but if we can make uh, the questions short so that we allow um, everyone who has questions <coughs> to, to ask, please. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Debbie Benzo from Save the Children. I just want to test two narratives that you seem to be suggesting. The first is that the sort of Syrian regime has mortgaged its economy to its allies. And I'm wondering what kind of interest rates you're imagining would be called in around that. The second point that you kind of alluded to in the talks was this notion of uh, money moving around. And I'm wondering. 
uh, what role you think and what pressure sanctions can have on individuals and on Syrian behavior, and in particular, whether the Paradise Papers and the sort of revealing of Syrian money being moved through the Seychelles, et cetera, is something that other actors should want to pursue and look at as a means of influence over the Syrian regime. Briefly, if you have yeah. please, yes. I, I, w what is, I think, important in terms of the sanctions, uh, what we need to look at in the, in the, in the near future, I think is what the Americans are going to do. Clearly, in, uh, I was uh, in Washington a couple of weeks ago, and clearly the way the Americans are talking, they, they plan to put more pressure, economic pressure on the regime, and in particular, I enforcing sanctions, uh, and uh, because you're raising uh, the issue of how the money is being channeled. So we are going to see, I think, more efforts from the Americans to close, if you want, what they b b consider are gaps in terms of how you know, this is uh, uh, going through. Mortgaging is the right word. I mean, they have indeed mortgaged uh, uh, you know, the, the Syrian economy, but the Syrian regime is today in a, in a survival mode. It's buying time, and I don't think it has really re uh, thought about the really long term. It is trying to, to play in between the Russians and the, the Iranian, giving here a contract to these, giving another contract to those, uh, trying to bring in other, for instance, the Chinese. Again, the, the, the Syrian ambassador to Pekin promised the Chinese government that if you bring in money, we will give you oil and gas in exchange. But he already promised the Iranian, he pr already promised the Russians, and it has very limited oil and gas. So, but for the regime, the advantage is the more you can have players, the less direct pressure there is on it. And that's what they're trying really to, to work on. Uh, we'll have a gender balance. So we'll start with the lady here and then come back to you, uh, the two gentlemen in the, in the middle. Yeah. Thank you. Um, good morning. My name is uh, Giselle Dalton. I run the Iraq and Syria policy team at the Ministry of Defence. Um, thank you very much for your interesting and sobering comments. Um, following on from uh, Mr. Sawaz's point about um, the priority of stopping the regime from uh, bombing its own people, um, I want to ask uh, what your recommendations would be for the best way that the international community can put pressure on the regime to do that without uh, making the situation worse, for example, by escalating the confrontation with Russia and Iran. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not quite. Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure I understood the question. Could you please? Um, how can the international community put pressure on the regime to stop bombing its own people? <laughs> well, okay. So. You, you don't you don't pressure the regime. You don't you don't put pressure on the regime because the international community has already put every possible pressure on on the the regime at the economic uh, level, sanctions, uh, political uh, siege, etc. The the uh, only possible way is that you 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 pressure the Russians. It's 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 very difficult to make a pressure on the Iranians, but you pressure the the the, the Russians the Russians in order to exercise their power on on uh, the, the regime. Uh, the question is, what do the Russians want from Syria? I believe that the Russians historically wanted from Syria uh, three things. They 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 wanted to keep their influence in the Syrian bureaucracy. They want the uh, economic uh, benefits and, and uh, review, and then they want to keep their uh, military base in, in, in uh, Syria. Uh, 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 if the international community reaches a serious, deep agreement with the Russians on these three issues, I think the Russians do not have high appreciation to, to Assad. They do not like him, and they stick to him because they have always felt that the uh, the uh, the Obama administration and the European uh, governments have treated them with um, with arrogance and and uh, little respect. While they, di they didn't have the the leverage in order to make them listen uh, listen to them. Uh, is it is it too late now? I cannot answer this question. Uh, is an internet is a military uh, intervention feasible now? I think it's too late for an inter an, uh, for a military intervention. I myself was in favor of military in intervention in 2012 and 2013 when the uh, when the regime used for the first time um, the chemical weapons against the people in Ghouta. 
Uh, and at that time, uh, ISIS didn't exist, and Nasrallah was very small uh, in influence, and uh, the entire Syrian revolution has not yet been radicalized, and the the uh, society has not been yet so deeply divided as it is now. The, the chance was lost because of uh, the, the ridiculous compromise which happened between the Russians and the Obama administration at that time that Syria uh, submits part of its uh, chemical arsena. Uh, and uh, the, the, last, uh, the, the chance was lost. Now, any military intervention will mean boots on the ground. And whenever you put boots on the ground, that will mean that these boots will not leave the country easily. We, we, see th we, 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 we are seeing this with the Turks, we are seeing this with the Americans, and we have seen that with the Russians and uh, Iranians. The, 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 the game of the stick and the carrot is uh, the only possible way that has been left for, for us to, to deal with uh, the Russian. But this should be done in a very serious and the strong, serious, but also diplomatic way. So the, the international community needs to make the Russians understand that there will be serious consequences if uh, they do not cooperate in this uh, regards. Unfortunately, with the current international situation, with the Trump administration that is very weak towards Russia, uh, I don't see things uh, uh, hap happening soon. So the situation is very dark, it's very complicated, it's very complex, and there is no simple answer to any, to any question like this. Uh, Jihad, you wanted to add on this, if that's briefly, please. Talk yes, uh, you know, when you ask the question, we all laughed. And the fact that you are work with the Minister of Defense makes us even laugh more. Because you should know what should be done, right? <laughs> In 1998, when the Turks wanted Ojalan, there was this single card of the Syrian regime with the Turks. They threatened the regime, and he gave up Ojalan. In 2005, when the International Committee wanted, Bush, wanted Bashar out of, Syria, of Lebanon, and Lebanon was a jewel of the crown of the Syrian regime. Just like this, the regime withdrew. Humiliatingly, they withdrew. And in 2013, when you wanted the weapons of mass destruction out, the only single weapon of mass destruction the regime has in face of Israel, it also gave it up because it was terrified. You need to threaten him militarily. You don't need boots on the ground, but you need to threaten him. You don't want to threaten him, aid, money, you know, all this talk. Well, you can talk about it. It won't change anything. <coughs> We have two questions together, please, as the gentlemen have been waiting, and then we'll come back to you. Hi, uh, Rashad Qattan from Garda World. My question to Jihad Yaji, um, question on the banking sector. I think it's not been discussed widely. What do you think the role of the banking sector, especially private banks, in the Syrian reconstruction phase? A few days ago, the Minister of Finance, the banks overall, private and public, they have around 400 billion Syrian pounds, which is around $900 million, to actually loan reconstruction other way. Do you think that's sufficient? The second question about the Lebanese banks who in the eight, past 18 months started leaving or divesting from their subsidiaries in Syria. Why do you think they are doing it? Thanks. We'll take another question and then like three questions together, yeah. A super quick comment and a, and a, and a question. Um, I was in Syria April 20... Can you 20 introduce yourself? Uh, sorry, uh, Brahim Alabi, Syrian Legal Development Program. Um, I was in Syria April 2017 when the chemical attack happened, and I was um, that week when Trump bombed. The entire extremist rhetoric in Idlib was just shattered because they were like, are the Americans with us? Are they still against us? Yeah, a lot of uh, kind of uh, uh, lower level extremists, uh, the rhetoric amongst them was so confused of what they were told that the Americans will never stop and, and, and help you, well, uh, Trump really just threw their card away. So it, it does work to counter extremism when you have precision strikes li like what happened. My question is uh, about this, um, when, when the EU says we will not uh, um, participate in reconstruction unless there's a political se settlement, sometimes they use transition, sometimes they use solution, which for Syrians mean very, very different things. Who actually do you think has leverage uh, uh, over the other? Does the EU have leverage over Syria or does the Syrian government have leverage over the EU given that the EU wants to return refugees, wants to uh, try and figure out a solution to, to the conflict? Because we see the EU making uh, compromises. The Syrian government was clear about it. We will not allow Europeans to come in without uh, uh, an apology. That's, that's the public line. 
So if you had maybe uh, you can just answer the, the, the questions and also um, uh, also uh, why. Well, on the, um, uh, the the banking sector. Uh, Yes, I mean, the banking sector today, uh, in, in real terms, the uh, Syrian banking sector is very small. If you lo look at the combined assets of the 14 private sector Syrian banks, at the end of 2016, we don't have yet the full data for 2017, it was $3.5 billion. To give you an example, Bank Audi of Lebanon, a single bank, has assets of $50 billion. 10 times, 15 times this number. So the private sector in Syria, uh, uh, banking private sector is very small. The government has said indeed that it wants banks to lend money, but the answer is in your question. $900 million to fund is very small. In addition to that, the banks are very reluctant to take risks. Syrian banks are not lending. They lend a bit for consumer uh, uh, consumption, but not for large scale long-term investment. You have a lot of issues, you know, the, the value of the, of, the, of the pound, the general insecurity, and all of this. In addition to that, uh, you also mentioned the, the Lebanese and other banks withdrawing. In ex indeed, Lebanese banks that manage seven out of these 13 banks in Syria, or 14 banks in Syria, are as, as much as possible, they are reducing their Syria exposure. Bank Audi, or even at one point, changed its name last year to Al Ahli Bank but they were obliged to, you know, didn't, uh, you know, implement that change. Uh, in, they are extremely, extremely fearful of doing business uh, in, um, in, in Syria, with Syria. If you are in Lebanon, you cannot afford to transfer any money uh, with the mention that it's for a Syria project, even if it's from Lebanon to France, say. So, no, the, the banks are not willing to take risks, and I don't think banks will play a meaningful role anytime soon. This, the, the U.S. sanctions are just frightening them. Uh, well, and maybe you can talk about the, we respond to the question yeah, about the leverage. Uh, we'll get leverage over the other. Um, well, listen, I don't think the refugees in the EU countries will return to Syria. Uh, the, refugee, the Syrian refugees that went to the EU countries are middle class or upper, upper middle class that are talented, skilled, and professionals, and they can easily find a way or another to mingle, to, to be integrated with the society, and to have a job, and to raise their children in a much better environment than, uh, than Syria. So if we are talking about a percentage of people who might return to Syria, it could be 10 to 20 percent, while 80 to 90 percent will not return to Syria. So the damage, if you, if you want to portray it as damage, uh, is done, and there is no way to, to mend that uh, that damage. Uh, so the, the the regime needs. Okay, so what does the regime need now? Number one, survival, uh, which he, which it is trying to do to pay any price for it. And number two, recognition. You need you need the, this regime needs to be recognized as a legitimate uh, regime, and it will pay any price possible for this legitimacy and for this recognition again. This is a, a, a weapon which the Western uh, governments, the Europe and the United States, have uh, against uh, this uh, regime. The uh, the Syrian regime now, I don't think it has leverage on on or against the Europeans, because the 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 uh, weapons which he which he could use and he did use when when uh, when Minister Walid Muallim threatened uh, directly or indirectly uh, Europe. Uh, and when the Grand Mufti threatened Europe of sending uh, suicide, uh, suicide jihadiyin and, and bombers, etc., this is over. The regime cannot do anything, anything at all now in this regard. So I don't see Bashar al-Assad having or exerting any leverage on the Europeans. On the other side, uh, the problem with the European is that all of the European governments are based on the maestro, which is the United States government. And this maestro now is a lost maestro, is somebody who doesn't know the, the, the musical instrument which he is uh, leading. And everything is pushing us into 
a, a chaos into a situation which no one can tell you what will happen tomorrow. No one can tell you. We'll take uh, two, two final rounds of questions. Uh, the lady here and uh, Asad, and then after that, yeah, to, and then we'll, we'll get finally to you, but then we have to more of you. Yeah, um, just go ahead, please. Alfreda Ailo, I'm a Syrian activist, and I have a question to Weil um, regarding your comment about hostilizing and ignoring certain communities close to the regime. Um, I am from the Syriani community, which is very close to the regime, and I always felt very alone of being against the government because there are not a lot of initiatives to include or involve uh, religious or ethnic minorities into the oppositions. And I'm asking, are there any initiatives now to think in long term how to get back the Christians to feel in any way connected to, to the rest of the Syrian uh, uh, people? Because it's the, the hate you mentioned that is getting stronger. I, I can sense it among my own people against me, like I'm accused of being paid by the CIA or a Sunni sympathizer. So I'm just like, are there active ways to be involved as someone from a minority? Uh, Asad, but very briefly, please. Very yeah. And then the answer is brief as well. <laughs> well um, the question is to Jihad. Um, on Decree 66, we didn't see a repetition of Decree 66 in any other area of Syria. Do you think Decree 66 was an exception to please the Damascene mercantile community? Or eventually we're going to see a repetition of Decree 66, let's say in eastern Aleppo or elsewhere? We'll get the answers and then we'll go to more questions. Yes. Why? Yeah. I will, I will, I will uh, refer it to Sinan. Yesterday we were having this, this very discussion yeah. and he had a brilliant uh, point of view about. Uh, you have to that. remind me of it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me start with two words if yeah, you want. Yeah, but if we make it short, please, yeah. I, I, w I will try to make it short. So there, 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 there is two things I want to, to, to mention here. Number one, the, the Syrian minorities from the very beginning uh, were involved in the Syrian uh, uprising, the Syrian revolution. The first few months, they, they, uh, many of them were activists and, and took to the streets and wrote and expressed themselves, etc. However, immediately after that, uh, many uh, Syrian minorities, in, in, including the Christians, alienated themselves from, from uh, the uh, uh, uprising. And the flow of the Syrian revolution has gone in, in a direction that they also ignored the, the Syrian minorities, and particularly the, the Christians. And this created a situation of uh, misunderstanding that turned to become mistrust and the Syrian, uh, if you want, the Syrian revolution, the Syrian opposition, the Syrian uh, intellectuals who are leading the process did not pay enough attention to that and they did not uh, try to recruit or to, uh, to, to explain the situation, to, to make channels between them and the Syrian minorities in order to re-engage the Syrian minorities in the revolution, and then with the 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 huge amount of money poured in the Syrian revolution that changed the Syrian revolution facade from being a, 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 a revolution for democracy and freedom and human rights into an Islamic Islamist uh, that's that scared the the uh, the minorities and the Christians. I I'm pessimistic here. I do not see now. Uh, a magic solution that might encourage the Christians in order to return to Syria. But this is not a, a problem that started with the uh, revolution. It had started before, and here where uh, Sinan can, can add. Uh, um, well, um, maybe I won't dwell much because uh, Lina is uh, instructing me not to, but I think, just quickly, uh, decentralization is a key word here. And maybe we can, you know, uh, discuss for this, this um, after. Jihad, you had to answer. Um, yes, uh, I also want to say something on the minority issue. I think the uprising uh, has revealed to the Syrians the divides among us. Yeah. Sectarian, ethnic, class between cities, city. Yeah. And we have not, because we either we prioritize the fight against the regime or because very simply we don't have a history of negotiating, of 
we don't recognize, Syrians don't admit to their divisions. Uh, and I, I keep telling Syrian friends, it's not shameful to have divisions. In the UK, a wealthy country with very strong institutions with the rule of law, a part of the country wanted to <laughs> secede. Uh, is the same in Spain, the same in Canada. Uh, the, the difference between whites and blacks in America in terms of revenue are much, is much more profound than any divisions of other type in our societies. The big difference is that in these countries, First of all, these issues are recognized, and then you have the political institution and the political, political culture to debate them and to find ways to negotiate and compromise. We don't have any of these. We disagree, we have the guns, basically, and there is no real discourse. You, you are right to mention it, but anyway, that's a big issue. Uh, Assad, Decree 66, is uh, the Syrian parliament has already passed amendments to the decree so that it is, can be implemented across Syria. The decree hasn't been signed by Bashar al-Assad. It should be in the, in the next few weeks. So uh, the last round, like three questions quickly because we have five minutes left. So the lady here and Hayed and then uh, finally Tim, please. Thanks. Um, uh, I'm Rowan Yamanakar. I work for the Department for International Development. Um, so I wanted to ask a couple of um, jihad and while you, you referred to the fact that uh, the, the regime somehow manages to, to benefit from, manipulate, get legitimacy from certain types of foreign aid. You talked about um, NGOs and, and wives, etc. Uh, so my question is, is there anything more that we can do in the, in the international community to prevent this or, or reduce it? And if not, is there an argument that we should stop? Hyatt, please. Yeah. Hi, uh, Hyatt, Hyatt, Chatham House. Uh, just quickly to comment on what Wa has said, there are many surveys who have, that have been done in Europe and refugees said that they're willing to go back to Syria, but they will only do that if Assad is, doesn't stay in power, meaning if they feel safe to go back in Syria. The comment, uh, the question I have in mind is, basically we have been talking about Assad winning the war, but we don't talk much about what happens in those areas that have been captured by Assad. For example, in uh, Daraya, which is just a few kilometers outside of Damascus, uh, people are not allowed to go there. Services, they are not basically taking place there. Uh, Eastern Aleppo, many people are scared to go back there. Services are, they don't exist there. And the other issue here which related to construction is that people think that even in the future, if reconstruction is channeled to the regime, the regime will not basically invest any penny in those areas because it will continue to punish them and will <coughs> basically reward the loyals. Thank you. Um, Tim Eaton from Chatham House. A uh, question for Sinan. Uh, you, you talked about the regime-aligned militias and the questionable command and control that the regime may have over them. I just wondered how you see that power balance evolving. You mentioned maybe that actually, um, as, as the regime's military position becomes stronger, <laughs> their leverage might become less. And I wondered if you might be able to point any signposts which could indicate the shift in power balance between that relationship. Uh, we'll have one minute for each to answer and wrap up uh, before we uh, enter uh, we end this session. Please, Sinan, start. Okay. Uh, well, you ask a very uh, tough question, it's a thesis question, to be honest with you. But uh, um, th that said, uh, it doesn't mean that Assad is, is completely out of control, you know, or is not able to exercise any control. Assad is still in the eyes of his public, of the loyalists, of, this of these forces, the elected president. And he has this legitimacy that uh, by, by default is able to delegate to them. So his presence to them is very important. He is the center of consensus for loyalist force. He doesn't have the force to command them, but he has a le the, the, this legitimacy in between courts that allows him to play them, to play this actor one against the other. Uh, uh, previously, uh, this was also the case, but the regime still maintain a large force uh, that uh, make him the strongest among the, the, the clique. Now, it doesn't have this force anymore, actually. I think uh, the best case scenario in this taking about 30 southern uh, men that are commanded directly by the Syrian Arab army, whereas we're speaking about around 80 southern uh, in, in paramilitaries. Uh, so, I would like to to to, to keep uh, you know describing the you know what could be the future, but in my opinion, it will be a long, very very long process of <laughs> playing one act one uh, one actor against the others and so on in a small manner, with small conflicts that will erupt uh, across the country, especially uh, in western Syria. Uh, but it's with no guarantee it will work because 
the regime will need lots of assets, lots of money, lots of resources, lots of human resources to be able to lead this. Jihad, please. Yes, the humanitarian uh, aspect. Uh, of course, you should not stop. You cannot stop providing aid. And you are not going to stop because you don't want refugees to come, right? I mean, and because there are needs. Uh, uh, but I think what you can do things. First of all, you can put much more pressure on UN organization. You are giving them money, these people. Who are the contracts being awarded to? Today, the, the UN money is the main source of uh, consumption in Syria for businesses, the main contracts. I was talking recently to a, a Syrian businessman. He was in Beirut. I was telling him, how is the business? He, he's, he's telling me, as long as there is the UN, there is business. There is no problem. We can work on the UN. Because uh, if you want to know what perception we have of UN people, you just follow the Twitter feed of the head of UNDP Syria, which is a shameful, really, absolutely shameful. I just don't understand how you can, nobody takes uh, action. I mean, he has been retweeting an event in uh, Opera Damascus, which was for the handicapped organized by the regime. And he was retweeting how great this country takes care of its handicap. And the regime is the guy, uh, you know, the other party responsible for this. You, know? you can also do other things. You can push for projects that, may, that will not be accepted by the regime, but at least politically it's important. For instance, you can offer to rebuild Daraya. But you can say, we are going to rebuild Daraya, for instance, or Qusayr. But we have a condition that all the people who return are provided political and security guarantees, so everybody can return, that all the people who return recover their properties, uh, and that the money is handled directly by a specific fund, not through the central government. In that way, you say, well, we are really willing to rebuild. We are going to put money in the Syrian economy. We want to encourage refugees to return. The regime is not going to accept, but at least politically, it's something you can offer. Uh, well, I'll just final one minute, if you have any answers. So uh, just to wrap up, we need, we need to mend the, the fracture and the Syrian fabric. This is a must. We cannot go forward without doing this very difficult, next to impossible mission, but we cannot go forward without it. Secondly, the regime uh, looks for legitimacy and recognition. We cannot give the regime legitimacy and recognition because it will use it against us, against the Syrian people. Uh, so it's very important to, to remember that. And thirdly, reconstruction, as, as Jihad said, can be a double-edged uh, uh, weapon uh, tool, sword, and we, we should be smartly, smart enough in order to use the, the edge that uh, helps the Syrian people in reconstruction and in building a, Syrian, uh, a, f a future Syria and not help the regime continue existing and continue its repression against the Syrian people. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, all, and thank you for a great uh, panel today with uh, lots of uh, uh, information about an area that is untapped on uh, in the government area about the uh, divisions between uh, Russia and Iran, about the question of reconstruction, what the world can do or probably not doing about this. Thank you, Sinan. Thank you, Jihad. And thank you, Wael. We'll have a half an hour break and then uh, continue for the next session. Thank you. <laughs>